Hillard. I'm the RN here at the Centara Star Hill Center, and I want to welcome everyone to our second First Tuesday educational series. Uh, if you're not familiar with our center, um, we are affiliated with Centara Martha Jefferson, and we're downtown Charlottesville, and um, I'm an RN that works here in the clinic. Um, we don't have a physician. It's um, We work with the community members um, with chronic illness, um, with health prevention in the community, focusing on diabetes, heart disease. Um, um, my, my mind goes blank all of a sudden. Heart disease, diabetes, obesity, weight management, um, and stroke um, specifically. Um, and we help folks with um, weight management, nutrition, counseling, and um, all those kinds of things. So we started this um, educational series this year to um, try to help draw attention to some of these chronic illnesses and to help um, better educate the community members about these illnesses and hoping to prevent them. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Josh Fisher with us and he is a cardiologist uh, with Sintera Martha Jefferson and Cardiovascular Associates of Charlottesville. Um, and we will have him doing a presentation in just one second. Um, we do want to make everyone aware of a COVID-19 um, discussion regarding the vaccination. It's gonna be coming up on February 10th. Um, and um, Diana, I forget the time, on that, but I just wanted to announce that before we got started. Um, yes, it's at 6 p.m. Uh, and it's geared towards communities of color and hesitation. Um, and it's an open conversation with some healthcare professionals. So if you're interested, you can message me in the chat um, or contact Sator afterwards and we can give you more information. Thanks. Um, we will have the chat. Are you gonna open the chat, um, Diana, and kind of help me monitor that if you could, since I'm gonna help Dr. Um, Fisher with the slides. Yeah. And um, we will uh, leave room for questions at the end. And if you all can mute your um, phones or um, screens, that would be great. Um, and just to give you a little information about our speaker, Dr. Joshua Fisher, um, he is a native of Buffalo, New York. He's been a cardiologist at Martha Jefferson since 2004. He is board certified in cardiology and interventional cardiology and specializes in the treatment of coronary artery disease. He is married with three children and his wife is a primary care physician here in Charlottesville as well. So we wanna welcome you, Dr. Fisher, and thank you so much for being here this evening with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. And um, I've got a little bit of a, a slide presentation and I um, will leave plenty of time afterwards for, for questions, because I think for a lot of people, that's really uh, the big benefit of talks like this. So we go ahead with the, the next slide. Okay. And when we talk about the cardiovascular system and cardiovascular disease, I, I tell people just to remember that it, the heart's a pump. Its job is to pump the blood to the organs, to the brain, to the kidneys, to the muscles. And there's piping like any plumbing system. Those are the arteries and the veins. And when we talk about diseases of the cardiovascular system, we're talking about things that basically clog up the pipes. So it's like a, a plumbing problem or makes the pump so that the pump doesn't pump very well. Um, both of those are... are the common problems we see in the cardiovascular system. And don't worry, there's not gonna be a test or you're not gonna to have to learn all this anatomy. I just put this up there for illustration purposes. Go ahead to the next one. Okay, my little zebra went away, okay. So specifically as a cardiologist, I spend a lot of time uh, investigating and treating diseases of the heart. And the heart, like I said, is a pump. It's a muscular pump and it's got its own blood supply called the coronary arteries. And the coronary arteries are what can cause a lot of problems as we get older, they get blocked up and that can cause heart attacks 
um, and, and chest pain. And what the problem with those is when that happens, our pump doesn't pump as well. And again, I'm not gonna go through the anatomy here, but it's just to show that it's a plumbing system with lots of tubes, lots of pipes. We spend a lot of time uh, in school learning where all the pipes go and how all the tubes work. But for, um, for a patient's perspective, you just wanna remember that it's a pump and that it's gotta have its own um, blood supply to that muscle, just like your arms need blood supply and your legs need blood supply, that heart needs a blood supply. And remember your heart does its job and, and it's a muscle that works every day, all day. You know, it's not like your legs where you go for a walk and then you can sit down and rest. Your heart's gonna pump all day, every day from the day you're born and until the day you die. And so it's an important muscle and that blood supply to that muscle is really important. Okay, next one. So when we talk about cardiovascular disease in this talk, we're talking about, like I said, clogging up of the pipes. And in the top left there, you see your muscles, your uh, arteries are muscular tubes. They have uh, muscle cells around the tube and a normal artery has got a big opening. The pipe is completely open. On the, the, the top right there, you see a little bit of yellow plaque growing. And in the bottom left, you can see more plaque growing and the, the, you can see the pipe is starting to get clogged up. And if that pipe gets completely clogged up like the one on the right, that's gonna cause problems for that organ. If this is a heart artery, then it's gonna cause a heart attack. If it's in the brain, it's gonna cause a stroke. It can happen in the arteries to the kidneys. It can happen to the arteries to the legs and the legs we call it peripheral vascular disease. But it's all the same disease process. It's all what we call atherosclerosis or sometimes people, the old term is hardening of the arteries, but it's this disease of plaque buildup that clogs up the pipes. That's what we're gonna be talking about. Okay, next. Um, this, is a, this is just a picture of a clogged artery on the heart muscle. And again, if that artery gets clogged up, you see sort of plaque in there, the blood flow can't get through there. It's like, a, you know, you're, uh, you need Drano or something in a, in a, at your house when your drain doesn't, doesn't um, drain because of a clogged pipe. It's the same idea. It just blocks up uh, so that the fluid can't get through and that fluid is what's carrying the oxygen. Next one. So, uh, I give this talk every once in a while and I like to tell people or highlight how big of a problem is cardiovascular disease. And this is a, a statistics I've said for a long time that since 1900, cardiovascular disease, that's blockages of the arteries of the heart and, and of the brain causing stroke has been the number one killer in the US every year except 1918, which was the flu pandemic of 1918. This is the first year I've ever had to say the, the results aren't in yet all the statistics, but unfortunately I'm gonna to have to amend this talk to say also the year 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. So uh, 2020 will probably have more people die from COVID um, as the leading cause of death than cardiovascular disease. Now, a lot of those people, when they do pass from COVID, it's from cardiac problems, from heart attacks but those will be classified as part of the uh, COVID deaths similar to 1918. So that's an unfortunate statistic that I've never had to update on this slide and hopefully we don't have it for 2021. Um, in the US, that means nearly 2,600 people die of cardiovascular disease every day. That used to pop eyeballs when I gave this talk, but of course, if you watch the news or anything now, you know we've had 3,000, sometimes 4,000 people dying in a day from COVID. So, but this is every day sort of, you know, year in, year out, decade in, decade out. And that's an average of one death every 34 seconds. Go ahead, next one. I also like to point out that cardiovascular disease claims more lives each year than the next leading causes of death combined. So that's cancer, you know, um, COPD or respiratory disease, accidents, diabetes, and influenza. Again, except for 2020 in a normal year, the cardiovascular disease kills more people than the, the, all those other five combined. And not to say that it's, you know, breast cancer awareness and those things are not a good um, uh, worthy cause. But sometimes if you pull people on the street, um, you'll get a lot of answers about certain high profile illnesses. Most people don't realize that even if you add up all the cancers, um, they still don't lead to the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease. Okay, next one. This is uh, from 1920 through 2016. This is just the increase in cardiovascular disease from the last century. Um, it just shows not that many people were dying at the beginning of the century from this, but it became sort of an affluent as our society grew. And um, 
uh, obesity uh, became more of a problem, we do see some increase in cardiovascular death. We go to the next one. This is by gender. So this is deaths from uh, cardiovascular disease, the females in red and males in blue. And one of the things you'll see starting around um, about the 19 sort of late 80s, early 90s, we started to see some drop in cardiovascular disease. And that is attributed to a couple of things we think. Um, uh, smoking became less cool in the late 80s. Um, exercise became more, um, I don't wanna say cool, but it, we, the benefits of exercise. And there's some drugs that came on the market called statin drugs that help prevent death from heart attack and stroke. Um, those have all helped to drop our, cardi our death rates from cardiovascular disease. There was a slight bump after the recession in 2008. Um, and you see for males, there's still a little bit of an upward trajectory, but overall we're making good progress. Next one. This just highlights deaths from cancer and cardiovascular disease by age. And kind of like everything else, as we get older, all of these chronic diseases get worse. And so I'm not gonna go through this in any detail, but uh, more people die in their 80s and 90s from cardiovascular disease uh, than they do from, than when you're in your 30s and 40s. That kind of just makes sense. But this is a chronic disease that we don't have a, tr a cure for. We have treatment, but we don't have a cure. Uh, and so, um, that's something that is, um, you know, shown in all the studies. Um, it's sort of that way for almost any chronic disease. Okay, next. All right, so those are all, you know, uh, designed to just say, hey, this is a, a very common problem. It's a it's a dangerous problem that can lead to death. So what what as a patient can you do about it? Well, the big things I like to tell people as a cardiologist is know the risk factors. Cardiovascular disease isn't caused by one thing. It's not one thing you do or one thing you don't do. And we'll go through these risk factors, but it's what we call multifactorial. There are many things that kind of come in and add up to result in a blocked artery or, uh, or a heart attack. So we're gonna talk about knowing your risk factors, knowing what the risk factors are, knowing which ones you have. And then the next step after you know your risk factors is to control those risk factors. We can't really eliminate most of them, but we can control them. That's with lifestyle changes and medications. Uh, eat a healthy diet. You know, like I said, when, you, when I showed that drop off in the 80s, uh, we started to get good science on the, the health effects of diet. And um, that every study that's done now shows that the diet has a big role to play in treatment and prevention for cardiovascular disease. And then this, the, along with that is regular exercise. Um, there are, aren't too many chronic health problems that aren't benefited by exercise, but cardiovascular disease and blocked arteries is really, really responsive to regular exercise. And so one of the hardest things that I do as a cardiologist is to help people reg, realize how important exercise is and try and work that into their daily or at least weekly routine. And that doesn't mean you have to be, you know, go run a marathon. We're talking about walking. You know, if you can walk 20 minutes, um, doesn't have to be fast, but just walking for 20 minutes without stopping is enough in all, all kinds of studies to show you can significantly reduce your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Okay, next. So when I say know your risk factors, these are the common risk factors that we learn about when we're in school and we're learning to be cardiologists that um, put people at risk for developing blocked arteries or cardiovascular disease. Uh, age is one, I talked about that, the incidence goes up with age. So for men, it's age greater than 55. For women, there's a, a decade delay roughly, and it's over age 65, we see the incidence of heart disease go up. The second one is a family history of cardiovascular disease. Now, when I was in school in the 90s, we were told that genetics uh, in medicine was gonna revolutionize everything. And by the year 2000, you could get a drop of blood and get your patient's whole genome and you'd be able to find the heart disease gene. Well, it turned out as we learned about genes and, and the genome that it's really complicated and there's not one cardiovascular gene. There are protective factors and there's um, bad factors and you can get one of one and not enough of the other. And so what right now I still like to just tell people it can be hereditary. There can be things that passed on from your parents but we don't exactly know what that is yet. That's the more we learn about that, the more um, the, the, the more complicated it gets. 
Um, the next one on the list there is smoking. This is also what we found out, like I said, in the 80s is the incidence of smoking in the general population started to go down. And with that, the rate of dying from heart disease went down. Smoking is, and we'll talk about that. If you're gonna do one thing, um, I tell people the top, if they're a smoker, the top five things they need to do to reduce the risk of dying from a heart attack is number one, stop smoking. Number two is stop smoking. Number three is stop smoking. Number four, stop smoking, and five is actually stop smoking. So that's a big one. Uh, the next one on the list there is diabetes. Um, we've learned in the last 20 to 30 years that uh, diabetes and heart disease kind of go hand in hand. And if you have diabetes, you're likely to have at least a little bit of, of atherosclerosis. And so diabetes and treatment of diabetes is very important. Um, it's sort of second in line behind smoking. Obesity is also on the list. Uh, in our country, um, there's been an increase in obesity over the last sort of 20 years. And when you track the obesity rates, you'll often find the same statistics for heart attack and stroke will follow right behind that. And that's a complicated one because it's not one thing. Uh, and what I talked about on those, the previous slide about exercise and diet has a role in obesity. So they're all tied in and it's, it's not a simple one-to-one -one factor but that is something that we've realized uh, will increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. High cholesterol is another one, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, that there's some good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, but that high cholesterol levels uh, will help to build that plaque up in the artery a lot faster. And then the last one is high blood pressure. So these are our, our risk factors. When I see somebody in my office, I go through this list mentally to see how many of these do they have. The more of those they have, the more at risk they are for developing a blocked artery. And then more likely that their symptoms of chest pain or whatever it may be are related to this disease. Okay, go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> so I've, out of all of these risk factors, the top two are what we call non-modifiable. You can't do anything about them. If you come to me and you say, geez, I'm 70 and I think I might have a blocked artery, I can't make you 30 again. If I could, I'd probably be retired and on my yacht by now rather than giving talks, right? But family history is the other thing that is not modifiable. We can't change your genes yet. You know, maybe 10 years or something like that, we'll be able to find some of these genes and knock them out or add a protective gene or something. But right now, those top two risk factors, we can't change. So that means we have to be very aggressive on the ones underneath there, smoking, diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Those are the modifiable risk factors. Those are the things that you as a patient can do something about. Go ahead, next one. So first on that list, smoking, I've talked about it. The, the number one thing, and I don't mean to make it sound easy because the tobacco companies knew what they were doing when they got people addicted to nicotine. Um, you know, in the 60s, it's a great marketing if you can get people addicted to your product, they'll buy it for the rest of their lives, even if it kills them. So it's hard to do, but stopping smoking is probably the number one thing you can do. Modifiable risk factor is to get smoking out of there. It's not easy. There's nicotine gum and patches. There's prescription medications on the, the market now that can help people. Um, but it's a combination of willpower and support. And, and, you know, all the studies show it's not one thing that works for one for everybody. Nicotine gum doesn't work for everybody, the, the prescription medications don't work for everybody, but you try and find a combination that works for that individual uh, and sort of like punching your, your uh, fist in a, through a wall, the first few times you may not make it, but if you keep going, you keep trying. Uh, the, all the studies show that the success rate for smoking cessation is related to the number of attempts. Very few people are able to stop after the first time, but the more times you try, the more likely you are to get to be successful. And I like to use a, you know, an economic argument for people as well. I say, geez, you know, those cigarettes can't be free. And if you were to put how much you spend in cigarettes in a, in a jar, you know, in the in a cupboard in the kitchen, by the end of the year, you'd be surprised how much money is in there. You know, that's a, that's a vacation oftentimes per year that you're, you know, sending out, uh, out the window in, in smoking. So the number one thing if you're a smoker to reduce your risk of heart attack and, and, and uh, stroke is to stop smoking. Okay, next one. Diabetes. So this is, a, this is a, a complicated one that involves treatment with usually with your primary care doctor, sometimes an endocrinologist, uh, sometimes your cardiologist, but it's a combination of weight loss. We know that uh, obesity increases your risk for type two diabetes. 
uh, changing and improving the diet, regular checkups for the complications of diabetes. That's in the eyes. You see an ophthalmologist checking for protein in the urine that affects the kidneys and often seeing a cardiologist to make sure you're not getting blockages in the heart arteries. Um, we like to aggressively manage these. That means with the medications and there's lots of new diabetes medications on the market. They're, they're getting much uh, better at you know, controlling the blood sugar with less side effects. So that's an important part of it. And then, as I mentioned, increased vigilance for cardiovascular problems because diabetes will, will um, increase the risk that you got blocked arteries in the heart and in the brain. And so you wanna really be careful when you're watching for symptoms if you have diabetes. Okay, next one. <clears throat> cholesterol. So this is um, sometimes gets people confused because you'll hear about the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. That is true. There's, there's three things that, three basic things that make up uh, total cholesterol. There's the HDL, that's the good cholesterol, that's the protective cholesterol. The more you have of that, the better. There's the LDL cholesterol or the bad cholesterol. Uh, the more you have that, that's, that's bad. You wanna get that as low as you can. And then there's triglycerides, which are, aren't quite as linked to heart disease. They're really related to diabetes and obesity. And so if someone has diabetes, diabetes and they lose weight and their blood sugars come down, the triglycerides generally improve as well. So um, go ahead to the next slide. So when we talk about cholesterol, you'll hear, well, my cholesterol is okay or my cholesterol is too high. There's not one level for everybody. Which level of cholesterol is okay depends on your risk. So we talked about those five risk factors, six risk factors at the beginning. And as you see your primary care doctor or a cardiologist, they'll check your cholesterol and you may have a younger sibling or something that has a higher cholesterol level, but for them it's okay because they maybe don't smoke or maybe they don't have diabetes. But the more risk factors you have, the lower you want your cholesterols to be. And I won't go through this in detail, um, but uh, suffice to say, the more risk factors, or if you actually have had a heart attack or you know you've got blockages, then you want to be very aggressive and get the LDL cholesterol down under 100, if not closer to 70. Um, and then also with cholesterol, diet and exercise are a big part of that. You can raise the protective HDL cholesterol with exercise, and you can lower the, the bad LDL cholesterol with exercise. Uh, diet plays a role in it as well, obviously, as far as a high cholesterol, or low cholesterol diet. And then there are effective medications available. The class of medications that's the closest thing we have to a miracle drug in cardiology is called statins. They came on the market in the 80s. And they're part of that reason we see that reduction in death from heart disease is they reduce the rate of heart attack and stroke, regardless of the level of, of cholesterol you start off at. So if you've got high cholesterol, you don't want to say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. It's just what, you know, my parents gave it to me. That's not true. In 2021, we can do a lot of things about cholesterol. Some of it is on you as far as diet and exercise, but the medications are very, very, very effective. So that's something that can be managed well in, in this day and age. Okay, next one. How about high blood pressure? Same thing for high blood pressure. There's a lot of good treatment options for high blood pressure. When we talk about high blood pressure as a cardiologist, 140 over 90, so 140 is the top number of systolic, the 90 is the bottom number of diastolic, that by any definition is high cholesterol. When you're talking about 130s to 140s for the top number, 80s to 90s, depending on what risk factors you have and how old you are, that can be considered borderline. If you, if you know you've got a blockage or if you already had a, a heart attack or a stroke, then you are looking for blood pressures in the 130 over 80 range. Um, also, if you have diabetes, that's the goal where you want to be. So that's a little bit more uh, strict, if you will, the guidelines uh, over the last 30 to 40 years. We found out that sitting with a blood pressure of 140 over 85 or 140 over 90 over time increases your risk for heart attack and stroke. So that's, that's not, we don't like that anymore. So when you think of a good blood pressure, think of, <clears throat> excuse me, 130 over 80. Low sodium diet. <clears throat> Sorry, hold on just one second. <clears throat> sodium is a big part of blood pressure control. Um, I have this talk with patients maybe three or four times a day that the food industry is working against us and putting more and more sodium into food. So the only way to be on a low sodium diet in this day and age is to read food labels. 
You have to read the food labels because you can't go by common sense and you can't go by taste. And I tell people a low salt diet is 100, sorry, 1500 milligrams to 2000 milligrams of sodium per day. That's not a lot. That includes drinks, uh, unless it's water, everything has sodium in it. Drinks have sodium in it. Salad dressings have sodium in it. Barbecue sauce, ketchup, all the things we put on food has sodium in it. If I tell people, if I'm telling you 1500 milligrams for, for the whole day, as a way to illustrate how much sodium is in food, if you went to a fast food and got the number one value meal, you're talking three to 4,000 milligrams of sodium in that one meal. So that's one of three meals and it's three times the amount of sodium you should have in your whole day. So salt is everywhere, sodium is salt. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest drivers of blood pressure. I get people who think they're doing pretty well and are eating pretty healthy and they don't realize how much sodium they're eating because they don't use a salt shaker. They say, I'm on a low salt diet. I don't use a salt shaker. And I tell them, if you're not reading food labels, you're not on a low salt diet, it's impossible. You can't be on a low salt diet without reading food labels. If you make all your food from scratch, that's pretty good. You can be in charge of the sodium, but um, the food industry, as they make something, quote, less, uh, you know, low cholesterol, and they put that on the label, hey, low cholesterol, when they, they stop it from tasting like cardboard by putting in sodium, they put in sodium as a flavor enhancer, and, and all those things are sodium based. So if you um, can remember one or two things from this talk tonight is, um, pay attention to how much sodium you're eating. Most Americans eat two to three times the amount of salt or sodium that they should. And that's not on purpose, it's just they're not reading food labels, they're not clued into it. Uh, the other thing that we can do for blood pressure is exercise. Like I said, exercise will help all of these risk factors, helps diabetes, helps your cholesterol, it helps your blood pressure. And there are a lot of effective medications available, many different types of medication. And um, you know, if you can't control with diet and exercise alone, we use medications and should be able to get almost everybody's blood pressure down around 130 over 80. Okay, next. <clears throat> so this is just to recap those risk factors we talked about. So if you're sitting at home listening to this and you say, well, you know, what can I do so I don't end up in one of those statistics? What can I do so I don't get a blocked artery? It's know these risk factors, know which ones you have, and then control them if you have them, right? And that's gonna be in conjunction with your primary care doctor and maybe a cardiologist, um, maybe a uh, diabetes doctor or endocrinologist. Okay, next. So as a heart doctor, I, when I'm, I'm a subspecialist in that I'm an interventional cardiologist. And that means that I go in with a balloon and stents and open up blocked arteries. And I do this sometimes acutely for a heart attack. <clears throat> I'm on call tonight and, you know, two in the morning, I may get a page that says we've got a heart attack in the ER and I'm going to drive in and put a little tube up uh, someone's arm to their heart arteries and open a blocked artery. And so it's sort of a public service for me whenever I give talks to the community to talk about heart attack warning signs, because, <clears throat> you know, knowing your risk factors, and that's a long-term thing, <clears throat> but... You want to know if you, when you should call 911. And so one of the things uh, I tell people is if you're unsure, you're better safe than sorry. I'm in the better safe than sorry business. I'd rather have you come into the ER, find out your chest pain or your back pain was not a heart attack. And you sat there and, and they did nothing, quote, when they checked your EKG and your, your blood tests and told you it's not a heart attack. You'd rather do that than stay at home and say, oh, that's my acid reflux or whatnot and find out the hard way that it's actually your heart. So the common uh, heart attack warning signs are an uncomfortable pressure or squeezing fullness or pain in the center of the chest. It lasts for a few minutes, more than a few minutes, uh, and sometimes will go away and come back, especially with exertion. Um, pain that is like, you know, takes a second, ooh, there's one, it's shot there and it's gone, and there's another one, and it lasts a second or two, that's usually not heart pain. Heart pain kind of ramps up over three to five minutes and then ramps back down, uh, and it's people say it's hard to describe sort of a fullness and it's a deeper pain. The pain can go to the jaw, can go to the arms, both arms, often to the left is the classic, but it can go to both arms. It can also radiate <clears throat> down towards the stomach. Um, you can be short of breath with it. It can come, the shortness of breath can be before or um, uh, with the chest discomfort. You can get diaphoresis, we call this, or breaking out in a cold sweat, and you can feel sick on your stomach. 
So if you have the, any of those combinations, that's something that we don't like people to mess around with. We tell them call 911. We'd prefer you don't come in by, you know, don't drive yourself in. Um, if you call the rescue squad and you are having a heart attack, they can start treatment right then and there with, you know, aspirin and some blood thinners and that helps, uh, helps treat the heart attack and makes it a smaller heart attack. Okay, next slide. This is just a <clears throat> scheme of a blocked artery. In this case, it's uh, a right coronary artery in a shaded area of the heart on, in the picture. That's the area of blood flow or the area of heart muscle that's not getting enough blood flow. So it's like putting a tourniquet or squeezing off that artery. All the muscle downstream starts to die from the minute that artery is blocked. The longer that artery stays blocked, the more damage is done to the heart muscle. And heart attacks can sort of cause two, two bad things. One is they can kill you outright um, if you don't get that open. But even if you do get it open, if it's been closed for a long time, it can cause heart failure because that knocks off that heart muscle and that heart muscle scars down and is no longer contracting. And it's, it's, it's sort of dead heart muscle and it can't contribute to the pump. And then the pump doesn't work as well and the fluid backs up and you can get fluid in the in the lungs and that's called heart failure. And so that's one of the consequences we try to avoid with a heart attack. All right, next, next one. So I like to tell people, remember a heart attack is an emergency. If you have one of these uh, um, symptoms, um, you call 911, go to the nearest hospital. Um, if you can note what time the symptoms started, that's sometimes helpful for the physicians. And um, you know, if directed by the EMS or by a doctor, we'll give you aspirin. Uh, that can is a simple sort of, you know, everybody thinks of aspirin been around forever, but it's one of the more powerful uh, medications that we have. And so if you're having these symptoms at home, you can take aspirin, assuming you're not allergic, and, and call 911. All right, next one. So this is sort of wrapping it up here, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, as a patient, um, you want to get informed. You want to learn about your risk factors. You know, um, the place to start is usually the primary care physician. They'll, you know, your weight, uh, check your, make sure you're uh, not in the obese range, check your blood sugars, check your blood pressure, check your cholesterol. And then obviously us heart doctors are available for, uh, for cases uh, that um, need a little more help. There's some information here on the American Heart Association. They have a lot of, <clears throat> patient-centered information, cookbooks and whatnot, you know, how to eat healthy. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think I pulled up one of the, just an example, they have a lot of these sheets. How do I make my lifestyle healthier? How do I follow a healthy diet? One of them is how do I eat healthy when I go to a restaurant? That can be difficult, right? Um, what, what are the things on the menu that are healthier than some of the others? And the American Heart Association has a, a whole sort of focus on patient-centered education um, that I tell people is a really good resource. There's a lot of you know, misinformation out there. And so wherever you get your information, you want to make sure it's reputable and, and has, is backed by science. And so for me, I tell patients, you can't go wrong by going to the American Heart Association website. And there's tons and tons of information there. Uh, next slide. So uh, just to, to conclude here, it's your cardiovascular health, right? Learn which risk factors you have, work with your doctor to treat and control them, and try as best you can to follow a heart-healthy lifestyle. And next slide. I leave it there. It says, my bones are getting softer, but my arteries are getting harder, so it balances out. And now I'll open it up for any questions. I had a couple questions, um, Dr. Fisher. Um, on one of my handouts that I give out um, on high blood pressure, and it's focusing on the DASH diet, it has a um, guide for the blood pressure ranges. And it was just saying that the normal blood pressure now is supposed to be below 120 over 80. Is that what you um, teach your patients? I noticed you said, you know, you want to have a blood pressure no higher than 130 over 80. But, yeah, um, the ideal blood pressure is 120 over 80. There's some, um, there's a, that comes with a little bit of an asterisk because in older folks, 
um, we get what's called late mild blood pressure where the blood pressure goes up and sometimes spikes and then sometimes drops. Mm -hmm. And those troughs can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. If your blood pressure drops for <clears throat> you know, only 10, 15 minutes, but if the blood pressure drops low enough that you get lightheaded or dizzy and stumble, then you can break a hip, you can break a shoulder. And that can be in older folks, sometimes a fatal thing if you have a hip fracture. So in a lot of these studies, when they tried to get what we call ideal uh, blood pressure, 120 over 80, for the younger population, you know, 70 and below, it wasn't much of an issue. When you got into the 80s and 90 year olds, when you try to get that, you can overshoot. And uh, for a 50 year old, if they overshoot, well, maybe they feel lightheaded for a few minutes and they sit down and everything's fine. But for an older person, that can be bad news when they're walking around their home and they get real lightheaded and they trip. And then, so there were, there were non-cardiovascular complications with that aggressive approach in the older folks. So the short answer is yes, 120 over 80. If you can get that, that's perfect. That would be considered ideal. Mm -hmm. But we often, in, in practice, when I'm seeing someone who's 85 years old, if their blood pressure is 130 over 80, that's usually pretty good because we know as we start to get more aggressive and try and tune that down a little bit more, we start to get into like that hundred is <clears throat> where people will often get symptomatic. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Good question. I have a question. If you've been diagnosed with a heart condition, say for example, back in 2009, I had a heart condition and got a clean, well, I considered it a clean bill of health. And there's been no other episodes. Cholesterol's good, blood pressure's good. Are you still considered a heart risk? Or is there a period where you kind of, nothing's happened, you're cleared for good health? Um, it's more the first one. So if you've had a heart cardiovascular event, when we say that's like a small heart attack or a known blocked artery, or a stroke, you're always at increased risk for another one versus someone who's never had that before. Now, if it's well controlled, that's that you're at a lower risk than someone who's got it and isn't well controlled, whose cholesterols are high, whose blood pressures are high. And there are plenty of people with heart disease who live to be 95, right, or 100, uh, who have their their symptoms and their risk factors well controlled. So, but it's not like an ear infection where you can sort of take an antibiotic or pneumonia, you take an antibiotic for 10 days and then you're quote cured and that you don't have pneumonia anymore. Heart disease doesn't sort of work that way. It's a chronic condition. And so, you know, if we can freeze it in its tracks, um, that's a, we consider that a win, but we can never sort of, not yet anyway, can we sort of wipe it off the slate and say, you don't have it anymore. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question. And my question is, if the uh, factors that you talked about, let's say you have one or two of those, you know, factors, you know, diabetes or, or, or I'm not a smoker, but let's just say a smoker. And so at what point, let's say you're not experiencing any heart problems or symptoms, but at what point should you go to a cardiologist to have tests run and, and that sort of thing? Do you have to wait until you have a heart attack before you have certain tests run or, or can that be something done uh, uh, on a preventive um, thing? You know, you, you go to your yeah. PCP and you say, hey, you know, I, well, they know I've got this, that, and that. So should I be having a stress test? Should I be doing this, you know, to see if I'm go if I'm on the road down that road of cardiac uh, 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 heart problems or symptoms? Right. So that's a good question. The short answer is the place to start is working with your PCP. They are doing a lot of things during an annual physical that look for this. So um, checking the blood pressure being, you know, the vital signs, which a lot of people say, well, that's not what's the big deal, but that's a very helpful indicator. Oftentimes you'll get an EKG, uh, not every year, but the, that's a heart tracing and that's a screening tool. And if they see changes or issues on that EKG, then they can uh, talk about further, um, uh, you know, evaluation. Um, a lot of cardiovascular disease is symptom driven, meaning when do you get a stress test? That's usually 
when you have shortness of breath or chest pain or something like that. But that doesn't mean that even if you're asymptomatic, even if you don't have symptoms, you still want to be aggressive on your risk factors. So one of the things you don't want to think is, well, I don't have any symptoms, so my blood pressure of 150 over 90 must be okay. That's not the way to think about it, right? So that preventive, um, you know, my cholesterol levels, my blood pressure, you want to be aggressive on those, even if you have no symptoms, because, you know, for, for strokes, you don't have a symptom until the day you have a stroke. It's there in a lot of things leading up to it. The heart, you often don't feel good with exercise. You feel shorter breath. You feel chest tightness, and it tends to get worse with time. And so most people will present with, oh, well, it hurt a little bit last month, and now it seems to be hurting a little more. And when I walk to the mailbox now, it seems to happen every day. There's sort of a progressive. But you want to work with your primary care doctor to make sure your risk factors are well controlled, especially, I mean, even if you don't have any symptoms from that. If you've got symptoms, then we definitely do testing. But um, we don't necessarily do routine testing when everybody turns, let's say, 50, like colonoscopy. Um, the reason for that is a, a couple of things. One is um, if you have mild abnormalities on stress testing or on heart testing, what do you do with those? You treat the risk factors. You get aggressive on the diabetes. You get aggressive on the blood pressure. You get aggressive on the cholesterol. You stop smoking. You do all those things that you would do even if you had a normal stress test. So it doesn't change your management because the management should be aggressive risk factor modification. Uh, it changes your management once you have symptoms that need to be addressed. So that's why we don't do routine because in essence, you kind of, from the time you're 30 and start seeing a doctor once a year, you're kind of doing testing, if you will, or screening for cardiovascular problems. Uh, I got a question, doctor. Can you hear me? I can, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I understand the risk factors that you mentioned, but suppose you're developing clogged arteries. How do you know ahead of time, just based upon the EKG and the stress test? Yes, that's the short answer. So there are, there are screening tests that, you know, uh, EKGs, uh, echocardiograms are, are where we look with an ultrasound at the heart function. So okay. you'll see some um, evidence of it, meaning the pump's not pumping as well as it should. We'll see symptoms from that or signs on exam from that, changes in the EKG. And then you go, you, you sort of like peel the onion. You can start with stress testing. If that's abnormal, sometimes you'll need a procedure called a heart catheterization like I do, where I go in there with a, with a catheter and, and take an x-ray picture of your heart artery. So there's different levels, but the screening tests you start with, yes, are usually uh, started in the primary care doctor's office they can refer for stress tests. Sometimes the primary care doctor, if there's a lot going on, they don't order the stress test. They say, let's just get you to the cardiologist and let them figure out what, what you need. And that's fine too. So the answer is, how do you know? Generally speaking, there are signs of it based on um, the factors your doctors are looking at, your cholesterols, your blood pressures, your EKGs, and then if needed, heart testing. There's a lot of screening heart testing, ultrasounds being one, stress tests being another. Um, then they work very well. That's a talk for a different day because there's a lot of those. But um, we do a lot of cardiovascular testing uh, for people. A lot of time it turns out not to be their heart, thank thankfully. But anytime anybody has chest pain, shortness of breath with exertion, especially if they have risk factors, generally speaking, they're going to get a stress test or a screening test of some sort to look into their heart. And the chest pain is only in the center of your chest? Nope, it can be in the left side, it can be in the right side, it can be between your shoulder blades and the back, it doesn't even have to be chest pain. Can it come and go? Can it be a tightness and that comes and goes every so, every so often? Yeah, but it usually comes and goes in a pattern. It usually comes and goes with exertion. Pain that has sort of a mind of its own, it's you're watching TV and there it is for 10 minutes and then it's gone and then it shows up two hours later and lasts for 15 minutes. That's usually not heart pain. Heart pain is usually brought on by physical exertion, going up the stairs, walking to the mailbox, you know, carrying in wood, something like that, that, um, that will provoke heart pain. Your chest gets tight, you stop, and the, it sort of slowly uh, eases off over five to 10 minutes. Thank you. Dr. Fisher, could you just mention some of the differences that um, the pain that women might feel versus men? Yeah, so there's what they call typical symptoms. That's the chest pain in the center of the chest, elephant sitting on my chest. But there are also what they call atypical symptoms. That's really 
because when they wrote the textbooks in the 50s, they only included men and men wrote the textbooks. But women are still most likely to present with chest pain, chest pain in the center of their chest, but they have a higher incidence of some of these atypical presentations, which means stomach pain or nausea, pain between the shoulder blades and the back that radiates um, up the neck. Um, and so jaw pain or uh, neck pain, um, those are what we call uh, atypical presentations. Um, a lot of times those come in conjunction with chest pain, but not always. Sometimes you just have the neck pain. I had somebody who had a headache in the back of her neck. That was her angina. And um, it, she never had chest pain at all. So if you have those types of symptoms, especially if they're brought on by exertion, that's the kind of thing you want to let your doctor know. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, can the doctor get a good read on your heart when you go for your physical and they listen to your heart through three layers of clothes? Well, um, through three layers of clothes, um, that's pro you know, as a cardiologist, of course, I always listen to the heart um, onto the skin. Um, depends how good of a stethoscope you have that can play a role. Um, the physical exam is one part of it. You know, when you go for a physical, they generally do blood work, like check your cholesterol. If you have diabetes, check your glucose, your blood sugars. And <clears throat> so it's not just one thing. It's, and it's all kind of put together into a, sort of like a puzzle. And so for certain people, the you know, primary care doctor may say, you oh, know, we can keep watching this. And for certain people, they may say, you know what, two of these things, two or three of these things, I don't like the way they're, the direction these are headed. Let's do some more testing. Maybe that's see a cardiologist. Maybe that's an echocardiogram. Maybe that's a stress test. And I don't mean to punt that, but it's, it's complicated. It's not one answer for everybody. That's kind of the importance of having a good primary care doctor that knows you and, and knows your ins and outs is that it's, you know, if it was that easy, you could sort of just plug it into your phone and it would tell you what to do, but it's, it's really not that easy. All right, thank you. Any recommendations for the folks who um, take or have tried taking statins and have um, a lot or some side effects like the achiness and um, yeah, some, some, some people, um, well, I will say that the true incidence of muscle inflammation, that's a sort of serious side effect from a statin therapy is very, very, very rare. Um, the incidence of what I'll call dangerous side effects from statins is really, really low. Um, some people will have a subjective feeling of fatigue or that their muscles are sore. Sometimes uh, a supplement called coenzyme Q10 has been shown to help that. Um, that is something I'll tell people to try. Um, sometimes if you try a different statin, there's like five or six different statins and some people will feel a little bit more achy in the muscles from one versus the other. So as a cardiologist, if I have somebody who says, well, I couldn't take Lipitor, I will try them on Crestor, I'll try them on Zocor, I will try them on all of them before I give up on the statins. They're that good. I think they should be in the water like fluoride because they're so powerful in reducing the, you know, the incidence of heart attack and stroke. Mm -hmm. I tell people if you're standing on a stranded on a desert island, you want a, a pallet of aspirin and a pallet of statins and you, you should be okay. <laughs> Dr. Fisher. Yes. Hi, this is Linda Moore. I, I'm joining a little bit late, but I have a question about the coenzyme Q10. Sure. Um, is there a particular dosage that you would recommend for one <clears throat> trying that? Um, no, not really. So the, the bigger picture there is um, there's no good scientific data. It's probably a placebo effect, right? Okay. And the one I thing I tell patients when we talk about uh, supplements or nutraceuticals is to make sure you're purchasing it from a reputable store because they do studies every once in a while and they find that a third of these products on the market don't have anything in them but, but dirt and some dye. And um, it's a good business model if you can sell those pills and you don't have to put anything in them. And because they're not regulated, they're not, no one checks. Um, so, you know, make sure you're buying your supplements mm -hmm. from a CVS or a, a GNC <clears throat> and not necessarily from some store on the internet you've never seen because uh, buyer beware, it's an unregulated industry and 
you know, whenever they, they'll have a graduate student in chemistry do this every once in a while, and they'll go to the local pharmacy and buy a bunch of um, supplements, you know, the, the Iconaceas and the, the St. John's wort, and they'll put them through their mass spectrometry and find out that up to a third of them uh, don't have any active ingredient. So okay. just be careful. That's good to know. Yeah. I don't have any, I don't have issues with symptoms from taking the statin, mm -hmm. um, but I had just been told by a physician somewhere along the line that, you know, it may not be a bad idea to try coenzyme Q10. So. Yeah. I tell people that if they are worried about it, if they're, you know, my brother-in-law told me this, or I read on the internet that, and they're concerned about it, that it's okay. It's, it's, it's not been shown to be harmful. So that's the best that we can say. It okay. does help some people believe that they are tolerating their statin better and that is fine with me. But it doesn't in particular um, like benefit the heart itself in any way to take it? It does not, no. Nope. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate sure. your answer. Absolutely. I have a question. Um, I, I'd like to know if you have an alternative though to the statin. My liver doesn't like statins. Yes. I refuse to take a statin. Right. So the answer to that is there are alternatives to statin. And, but the downside to that is none of these alternatives have been shown to be as good at reducing heart attack and stroke. So they've tried over the last 20 years to come up with something that works in a different way that lowers the cholesterol. And they've been able to do that. There's one called Zetia, and there's some newer ones coming on the market that are non-statin alternatives. But the, the newest ones, they do show some reduction in heart attack and stroke. The problem with them right now is they are injectables. They're not a, a, a pill. That's a problem for a lot of people because they're expensive and you got to jab yourself with a needle. And, and so they're not as widely uh, accepted. I think in the next five to 10 years, we'll probably see some oral formulations, some pill form of these non-statin alternatives that do reduce heart attack and stroke. But the ones up until now, like Zetia is, is the one, it lowered the LDL cholesterol, that was great. But in all the trials, it didn't lower the incidence of heart attack or stroke. The only ones that have been shown to do all of that have been the statins. So you can't take a statin if your liver is inflamed, that's true. Um, the next best step would hopefully be one of these newer injectables as the more data comes out on them, that perhaps that might be a, a, you'd be a candidate for those. What about any natural remedies? Do you recommend anything that would be <clears throat> natural, such as niacin or red? Yeah. So niacin, we used to use that a lot, but that was studied in a trial maybe five, 10 years ago now, and it turned out it made the numbers better, but it didn't reduce heart attack and stroke. Um, there's something called red yeast rice that's got uh, a statin, uh, uh, a native type statin compound um, that has, it's like taking a very low dose statin. Um, but most people, if they really have trouble with a statin as far as inflammation in the liver, they'll have trouble with that one as well because it's, it's sort of very close. Um, what I would tell people in that situation is, uh, you know, heart healthy diet. So diet and exercise, we're going to have to play a bigger role. That's sort of the three things we use to control cholesterol, diet, exercise, and, and medications. And if you can't take the medications, you're kind of left with the diet and the exercise. Um, but again, some of these newer injectables, they're just coming on the market. One's called Prolulent. They do lower the uh, LDL cholesterol. There is some data to show they're reducing heart attack and strokes. The problem with them right now is they're tier you know, three. They're very expensive. Most insurance companies won't cover them and they're injectables, which is a problem for a lot of people. Thank you. Yep. I do have another question. You know, every time I see my physician or if I see um, the nurse, you know, they always ask the same questions. Do you have shortness of breath? Do you, have you had a fever, blah, blah, blah. Right. So how do I, how do I, I, all, I always have shortness of breath. Right. And so how do I differentiate that between, um, you know, a COVID symptom and, right. and heart disease? And, and, I all, and I always have shortness of breath when I'm bringing in wood right. or when I'm exercising. It's really hard is the short answer. Some of that is the art of medicine, meaning 
that's the benefit of seeing a, a primary care practitioner, um, nurse or doctor that knows you is that if it's, if it's a new symptom, if your shortness of breath is new, that's often something we'll look into. If it's been there for a long time, especially if you've had some testing on it two or three years ago and it's really not changed, that's a different thing. So I see you know, patients often once or twice a year and I ask them all the same questions um, because every once in a while you get a different answer. And it's not only sort of the way you answer, the, you ask the question, but also the way they answer it. And sometimes people will say, well, I don't know. It's not really, you know, maybe it's a, and you sort of, then you dig into it a little deeper because um, when you have changes that happen uh, very slowly over time, the patient may what's called auto-regulate. They stop doing some of the things they normally did because they felt bad. So I'll ask people, how's the garden going? And they say, well, I didn't do a garden this year. And they say, well, why not? Well, because every time I was trying to do my gardening in the spring, I didn't feel good. My chest hurt. So I stopped gardening. Now my chest doesn't hurt, but I'm not doing my usual activities. You know, uh, how's the walk around the neighborhood you do every night? Well, I stopped doing that three months ago. I, I couldn't breathe. And so I just stopped. And so there's that's that's the sort of art of, of seeing a patient taking their history is you've got to tease out. Is there something new going on here? Is this uh, a stable chronic condition that's been there? COVID throws a, a wrinkle into everything because you know you can be asymptomatic, of course, and have COVID. So when anybody's short of breath with a fever, you got to think COVID, COVID, COVID. That's just reality. Um, but that's the role of. It's not easy. Sometimes we, you know I'll see people that you sort of like you're on the fence. Geez, is this something new? Is it not? And depending when they've last had a, a test of their heart, we'll often err on the side of testing again to make sure that it's not a new problem. But it can be hard. I have a question. This is uh, Gerdy. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. The question is, you mentioned low dose um, statin. What is considered a low dose statin? Um, so five to 10 milligrams. There's some, some of them go as low as five milligrams. Okay. Um, the higher dose ones are in the 40 and 80 milligram doses. Okay. So is, what's the, like you mentioned Lipitor and Crestor, but what about Provostatin? Is that consider, it's in the same category? Yeah. So that's a statin. Provostatin has actually got a unique um, role because it's, it's metabolized a little bit differently. If you have somebody who's got like a lung transplant or a liver transplant and they're on immunosuppressives, we'll use Provostatin because it can be, it's metabolized a little differently. It's one of the older statins. It, mm -hmm. It's a category of not the most potent statins, but it can be a statin that people can tolerate. So oftentimes if I've got somebody who can't tolerate the, the bigger guns, if you will, like Crestor or Lipitor, we'll use a low dose of Provostatin and they'll be able to tolerate that. I'd much rather have them on a, some statin than none at all. Okay. The other question I have is, um, you said that you're talking about heart disease being a chronic disease. Have you seen a relationship between chronic diseases and depression or anxiety or any other mental health disorders? Yes, there is a, there is a, a, a large body of evidence for any chronic illness um, uh, dealing with depression and mental health issues. I see it a lot as a cardiologist when somebody comes in with a heart attack. So they're, you know, 50, 60, 70, otherwise previously healthy. They, you know, went with a walk with their friends on Sunday and then on Tuesday had a heart attack. And then I'm telling them, hey, now you've got this lifelong condition, it's life-threatening. And that's a lot to take in. And so, especially after a heart attack, there's a lot of um, coming to terms with having a chronic disease. And a lot of times that's the first time they've been diagnosed with a chronic disease. Now, if they've had, you know, COPD or something and they've kind of uh, it's old hat to them, then maybe it's not that big of a deal. But we do see it a lot of times for people with their first diagnosis of cardiac disease, they have trouble adjusting to that. And what does this mean for me? Does this mean I'm going to, but usually with time, if they stay with the program and they, they sort of learn that, Hey, I can live to be a ripe old age with this. I've got to make some changes, but if I make those changes, there's good treatment. And generally speaking, you know, they do fairly well with that, but it's something we tell people when they come in for a heart attack, when I see them the first few weeks after a heart attack that, Hey, um, we, we talk about depression. We talk about, um, how common that is. And oftentimes they'll need, uh, treatment for depression that doesn't necessarily need medications, but treatment for that depression, especially in that first year. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Dr. Fisher, there was a um, question in the chat that wasn't answered. Um, 
how is COVID impacting heart disease presently? And what are you projecting down the road for COVID survivors? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple of ways it's, it's affected heart disease. Uh, early on over the summertime and whatnot, we think it stopped people from coming in who are having heart attacks. They, they were reticent to come in, uh, scared to go to the hospital. So that's the first thing. That's sort of starting to, to be less of an issue because people are realizing the hospitals can do a good job. You can come in, get treated and not get COVID. Uh, the second thing COVID does regarding the cardiovascular system is one of the things that the virus does is causes blood clots in places you shouldn't have blood clots. And so blood clots in your pipes, in your coronaries, in your arteries, that's, that's a heart attack that clogs the pipe. And so we've seen, I've seen 30, 40, 50 year olds with COVID who are having heart attacks that they probably would not have had if they didn't have COVID because they're what we call hypercoagulable. Their, their blood is prone to clot. And it's difficult to treat. It doesn't it doesn't respond the way normal heart attacks do. And so, um, a lot of the deaths, the final sort of tipping point for people who've had COVID who die from it, is they die from a heart attack from a blocked artery from one of these uh, blood clots. Now they've learned over the last nine months they give blood thinner to a lot of people um, as part of treatment for COVID. If you get sick enough, they'll put you on an IV blood thinner to prevent this. Um, and then there's the third thing sort of that is more of an open question is there's some chronic changes. You can get inflammation. The, the virus can affect the heart muscle itself. We've known this about viruses for a long time. Every once in a while, you'll see a college student who's got a viral cardiomyopathy. That's a, an inflammation of the heart muscle and the muscle doesn't move very well. And we can see that with COVID. And that's a little bit more of an open book as to what the long-term uh, you know, consequences of that is. Um, it's sort of like that, the COVID long hauler syndrome. Part of that can be chronic inflammation or chronic uh, weakening of the heart muscle. We don't really know how to treat that other than standard heart therapy, you know, heart failure therapy. But that's a, another wrinkle of COVID that the cardiovascular community is going to learn about, uh, unfortunately, in the next, you know, six months to five years. Thanks. Does anyone else have any other questions? I want to thank you, Dr. Fisher, for a great informative talk. And um, hopefully we'll have you again, maybe, <laughs> speaking on maybe a different side of heart disease as there are many aspects to it. Um, so, and thank everyone who attended and for your um, patience with the questions and asking great questions, which were really helpful um, for all of us. Um, I do want to remind all of my Star Hill uh, patient participants that we do have Fresh Pharmacy pick up tomorrow, uh, the usual times, 10 to 12 and 5 to 6 in the evening. So if no one else has any other questions or comments, we will conclude and everyone have a nice evening and thank you all. Thank you.